Well, there's the obvious way you can get our e-news and read every day what we're up to, what we're thinking, what we'd like you to know, maybe do as an advocate, as advocates. You can, uh, you can go to our lobby day, which was usually the last Tuesday in February. There'll be another, maybe we can do it live, maybe we'll have to do it virtual, we'll have to see how that goes. But our regions are really our grassroots and our blood. And many of you don't know yet who the coordinators are and what they do and what events they might sponsor. You'll be hearing a lot from us because that issue, one of the issues we service at the conference, which is on policing, alternatives to policing, and you know, culture change, and, uh, and, and decriminalizing, how we support people, uh, is a big theme. And we'll probably wind up doing this in every region. So each of the regions will become more visible to you. And you'll also see the new map and find out where the new regions are and who are the coordinators. So we commit that you'll hear much more about what he, you can do next at the regional level from our regional coordinators and our staff. So. Okay, well, I guess we'll move it into the awards ceremony. Um, thank you again, chairs. Thank you, Lynn. Now, we've not done this quite this way. This is gonna be people coming in and coming off. So I hope Eileen is around. Are you, are you there, Eileen? Well, I hope she is. Don't leave me out here alone, please. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, we're gonna give out awards and we're gonna give out a number of awards. So we have people coming on and coming off the screen and there'll be, you know, I'll explain the award and then a presenter will come up and give the award and then the person who's getting the award will receive it. So each sequence will take about seven minutes if we do it right, so why don't we get into it? So we, our first three awards are Lifetime Achievement Awards. And um, we're gonna begin this year, this, this sequence with Bill Anthony, who's the godfather of psych rehab. He's just, you know, launched this movement, changed the face of services, inspired so many, and is sort of like the North Star for Niapas and so many people. So I wanna turn it over. I've asked a friend of ours, um, who really was there at the beginning of psych rehab and really helped it happen here in New York. He's come out of mothballs to, to uh, say a couple of words, and that's David Puccifero. David, thank you for, for giving the award. Oh, thank you, Harvey. It, I just want to say thank you to be able to say a few words about somebody I um, consider to be both a mentor and honored to be able to say that he was my friend. Um, I can't say for sure, but I don't think we would be here today, at least not in the same way if it wasn't for Bill. Um, I, I know that what Bill and his colleagues at Boston University did like the Cohens and the and Mary Ann Farkas and the dedication they had to bringing psychiatric rehabilitation um, into our lives was critical. You know, along with other people um, like you, Harvey, my other mentor, John Sheets, people like Chaku and Lewis and Courtney Harding, and it's so good to see George on the line, people like George, you know, I do know I would not be here today. People who supported me through being a family member. Um, what Bill did was Bill pushed at a time when the medical model dominated behavioral health or mental, mental health care. He was willing to stand up and say, wait a minute, people are able to go to work. People are able to have social lives. People are able to go to school. All it takes is the right level of supports and the right level of skills to do so. And Bill did not back down. When, when Dr. Searles and John Sheets called him on the phone and said, we've got a tough one for you. We want you to bring psychiatric rehabilitation into New York State. It was not easy. We, we fought, I think, every single person you can imagine to try to believe that this was possible. But through Bill's determination, his dedication, and his demeanor, those of you who knew Bill knew he was a gentle, soft man. He just kept pushing and pushing. And those of you who may have some one day been in an IPRT, I built that program based on the technology. 
it's almost a direct model of the technology. And, and, you know, I like to think that that was really our introduction into this movement towards recovery and rehabilitation. So Dave, um, and, Dave your two minutes of fame are almost up. Oh, okay. So uh, I believe Marianne is here to accept the award. She is. She's which is a screen. wonderful honor to Thank see Marianne you. again. And Marianne, I, on behalf of Harvey and the Niapras group, I can't think of a more deserving individual than Dr. Anthony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to give Bill's children a second here to say thank you or to say hello. I see Jill McFadden and I believe it's Jessica, even if it says Julia Benton up there. Funny, I don't know why it says that. This is Jessica. <laughs> You're representing your sister, the three Anthony girls. So I just wanted to introduce you, give you a second to say something, and then I want to say a few words on about Bill. Go ahead. Thanks, Marianne. We really appreciate it. Um, it's been amazing uh, since my dad has passed. We've heard so many stories from friends and colleagues that have told us how much he meant to him. And if you know my dad, you know how humble he was. He didn't tell us much about how well known and how well respected he was. I mean, we knew it just because it's my father, but um, it's been really, it's been really nice because it was the same way as a father. He was the absolute best, you know, one in a million to say the least. So thank you everyone. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Jill, did you want to say anything before I say my little bit here? You don't have to, but if you want to. Oh, you're mu muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, no, just reiterating what Jessica said. It's really sweet of you guys to honor him after he's passed like this. And, and I'm so proud of him as a father. And it is nice to hear about all these things he did in the fields that we were so unaware of growing up. You know, he was just the best father and he was put on a pedestal because of the father he was and it's like to think that every aspect of his life though is how he was it was how he was to everybody and it's really amazing to hear so thank you for honoring him today thank, thank you. you for being here yeah. thank you very much for that yeah. so harvey i just wanted to say um about five minutes as i was asked to do so you know, do give me the hook if I'm going over. I think I've I think I've squished it down. How do you summarize a life as full as Bill Anthony's? To his family, Bill Anthony was, as you heard, the best dad and granddad you could have, by the way. To me, he was a wonderful mentor and a close colleague who gave me the courage to be the best I could be. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about who he was to the field. As you heard from um, Dave Butchaferro, it's wonderful to see you, Dave. Uh, he made a huge impact. Mm -hmm. He arrived at Boston University, I'd like to remind you, before there was even an Iasporus, before there was a field of psychiatric rehabilitation. And at that time, many folks were in long-stay psychiatric hospitals, and mental health services spent a lot of time working on overcoming treatment resistance, A motivation, and mental illnesses for which clearly there could be no cure a time when the diagnosis of schizophrenia meant progressive deterioration. Bill, however, had the gift of sight to see beyond all that to what mattered the most. This was a time when psychosocial rehabilitation was mainly an anti-psychiatry movement that stemmed from a deep sense of injury perpetrated by long-stay psychiatric hospitals. Hospitals which incarcerated, controlled, contained, and experimented on hundreds of thousands of people. Bill took a leadership role in helping to define what psychosocial rehabilitation was instead of what it was not. He led us in spending the late 70s to early 90s, committed to the premise that everyone had the same aspirations, a decent home, a decent job, friends and a community. So simple a statement, but so powerful a notion that it shocked clinicians, administrators, families, and even people with lived experience themselves. And so it needed to be said in simple terms, scientifically, philosophically, over and over again, and he did that. What made Bill stand out was not only that he had the decency to see the simple fact that people with mental health conditions were not other or separate, but us, not like us, but us. 
he also had the intel intellectual rigor to bring us together to work on what that meant and how to achieve it. A psychiatric rehabilitation became better understood and we were able to create better methods for training the workforce in the systematic processes he instigated. He realized it was not enough. Mike Hogan was the former chair of the 2003 President's New Freedom Commission, which officially reoriented America's mental health services to recovery. On hearing of Bill's passing, he remarked, I believe that Bill Anthony was more responsible than anyone else in the world for defining and advancing the notion that recovery should be the vision of mental health services. Bill always listened. Most particularly, he listened to people with lived experience. And what he heard was that there was something larger than services and larger than the tools of rehabilitation. Most people would have become defensive as they listened to people saying that what they had spent their life working on was perhaps not all there was. He, on the other hand, sought out and heard the voices of the leaders of the consumer movement at the time and began fleshing out the ideas of recovery, always respectful of what belonged in the hands of people with lived experience and that role, the role that fellow travelers, as we called ourselves, should play. In the debate that followed uh, the emergence of the vision of recovery and who owned that vision, um, he always said the role of the professionals in any change process is to open the door to share the resources and opportunities that came their way with those standing outside the door. And that is exactly what he did. Bill Anthony provided resources and support so that Judy Chamberlain could do her work. He asked her what she needed and then simply gave it to her. An office, a fax machine, a telephone with long distance service, and then left her to do what she did best, to be the leader she was of the ex-patient survivor movement. He suggested to Dan Fisher and Judy that they write a grant to support the work they were hoping to be able to do. Then he gave them the support and concrete resources they needed to mount the grant, like someone to help them organize it, type it up, edit it. And that resulted in the National Empowerment Center that's still going strong 28 years later. When Harold Mayo wrote to him to say that his writings did not reflect his ideals, he and Harold, a person with lived experience who had attended one of his talks with no other position or official authority, began a 15 year friendship in which Harold edited his papers and gave him feedback. Wow. Bill, Bill Anthony was many things, a decent human being with the vision, tenacity and skill to advance simple ideas that were incredibly complex and at the heart of what we all do. Uh, his favorite poet was Robert Frost. The Mending Wall was one of his favorite poems. I'd like to close by quoting two stanzas from it. Jill's heard me say this before. Something there is that does not love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper, upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that does not love a wall, that wants it down. Bill Anthony spent his life tearing down the walls between us, and we will miss his gentle, fierce spirit and vision. Me, and that was that's so beautiful, so well put together, and it's, it radiates through you, but it goes back from Bill. You, you couldn't have said so many great things if Bill wasn't that great. I want to thank his daughters for joining us. I want to tell one quick story. In the early 90s, Niapras had a, con we had these conferences in the Cascos, and we were at Cutcher's. And we were on a panel, Bill and I and a couple of other people, about the future. And I remember saying something like to people, I said, you know, you really haven't been unemployed. You've been working on your recovery. And at some point, you'll be able to go out and offer that and get paid for it. And people laughed. And Bill got up and said, he's right. That's the way it's going to be. So he was, he was on top of it all the way through. So thank you to all of you, um, Mary Ann and, and the two thank of you, you, Jill and Jessica, and, and uh, thanks for coming. And we, we appreciate your dad. We, we hold him forever, as you yeah. do. You yes, know. we do. Thank you. And thank you for all the notes I see on the bottom of the screen coming across from people. That's really sweet, everything that they've been saying. And we appreciate that. Well, you're welcome to stick around. So. Okay. Yeah. I have to go back to work. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, well. Thank you, Thank you Harvey, for...
giving Bill this award. And You're very welcome. It's, it, was a, it was a board thank decision, you, but, but thank you. Okay, we're going to go to the next group. So the next award is also a Lifetime Achievement Award, and this would be to Cliff Zucker. Cliff, are you with us? There he is. So Cliff Zucker, when you look at his face, you say, who's Cliff Zucker? Many people don't really know Cliff. Uh, where'd he go? In fact, he disappeared. Oh, there he is. Uh, but Cliff is so important. He has promoted rights. He has protected people's rights and dignity, and he has saved lives and enriched lives. And in so many ways, he's a hero of mine. He recently retired, and so glad we're able to honor you, Cliff. And let me give you some examples. When I first, one of the first memories of my work in this, in this job was Ed Knight and I went down with Cliff to the Senate, and made with, with, with Dave Walner, you may remember. And it was pushing back against the proposal to make it easier to force people into treatment using gravely disabled sort of criteria. And Cliff was our guru. He was our lawyer. He managed that, that situation. Fast forward, Cliff's work has been particularly, in my mind, been uh, really moving in the way that he tries to protect people's rights and gets them out of institutions. Uh, and I mean state hospitals, and I mean prisons and jails and nursing homes. That is breathtaking to me. Uh, because of Cliff Zucker, less people are restricted, are put in solitary confinement, and there's more oversight. And people aren't getting the loaf and, and, and all of the humiliation and torture. I mean, there's still plenty of it, but he reduced a good deal of it with his skill and his power. Um, and then he... Um, you know, he did the same for nursing homes. He was able to get a number of people out of nursing homes. And, you know, we're still really looking to put a ban on solitary confinement, but that is the next iteration from what Cliff is going to do. Finally, adult homes. Cliff has been at the center of this lawsuit, this Olmstead lawsuit, that's trying to help upwards of 4,000 people that were essentially dumped in New York City for-profit adult homes, in many instances with t terrible outcomes. Uh, and Cliff and many other lawyers and groups around the country, but Cliff, Cliff has led the way. And, you know, we still have a ways to go. There's a settlement. Things are moving slowly. But, you know, we owe it to Cliff to even be in the game. So, Cliff, I really want to thank you for all that you've done. And uh, I ho hope you'll be able to share a little bit back about that. Thanks. I really appreciate this honor. Uh, especially coming from Niapers and coming from you, who I could not respect more. Um, it's been my honor to work with many uh, people at Niapers at CAID, um, with Ed Knight, who you mentioned, uh, who I remember so fondly, um, for over 30 years. Now, and uh, I'm a lawyer. I, I bring litigation. That's a large part of what I've done over the last 30, 31 years. Um, litigation on mental health rights issues. But uh, I do believe that litigation is not effective without vigorous advocacy and lobbying from the people who are affected by these policies. Um, you know, it's not an ivory tower thing that lawyers sit back in their offices and, and that they can accomplish much without the kind of uh, groundswell of advocacy and lobbying that, for example, we saw uh, during the shoe litigation, which in addition to a good settlement that, Im that greatly improved, um, that got a lot of people with serious mental illness out of the shoe and into more humane treatment settings, uh, we had a grassroots movement that was so powerful that we got legislation. And, um, and that, to me, actually, in my whole career, was the, the prime example of how litigation and social advocacy and ought to work and works together and it's and reinforces each other. So um, I think without that, it's really impossible to make any real progress. And Niapras and Harvey um, and, and CAID um, and so many others of you um, are doing that every day. You are tireless. You are relentless, and it makes it made it possible for me to accomplish the whatever I may have accomplished. Um, I sure didn't do it um, alone. Um, 
you know, over the years, as Harvey said, we have fought to get people out of solitary, people with mental illness out of solitary confinement and into more humane, humane settings. And while that work is not done, um, for some people, it has made a big difference. The, um, certainly the struggle goes on. We have fought for adult home residents who deserve to live in their home, their own homes with the supports they need, not in these awful institutions. And um, while that's been a slow slog, um, at least a thousand people now live in their own apartments uh, in New York City who previously had been consigned to a lifetime in these dismal, awful institutions. Um, we've um, fought the same fought for nursing homes and every step of the way, we did this with the support and encouragement and advice <laughs> of people like Niapris and Harvey and, and, and uh, CAID and uh, we couldn't have done it without you. And something that long ago that we did uh, that, that I think has kind of almost been forgotten is that um, back in the, in the uh, 1980s, uh, the Office of Mental Health was conducting um, risky ex experiments on psychiatric patients without their consent. And we brought litigation, which resulted in that practice ending, and uh, hopefully will never recur. So none of this work is finished. I know you will all carry it on. And um, so I wish to honor all the great advocacy that you all have done and will continue to do in the future. And it has been my pleasure to work with you all these years. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you so much. Enjoy your retirement, but I'll be calling you. You know I will. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're running a little late. I'm going to go right into the next one. Another Lifetime Achievement Award, also about rights, is George Ebert. George Ebert, since the early 1970s, has been a significant national figure. It's a solo written, I'm going to read it. In the anti-psychiatry and psychiatric survivors movement, radicalized by three periods of involuntary incarceration, Ebert founded the Mental Patients Liberation Alliance in 1978 as a self-help, mutual support, human rights, and advocacy organization. And he has spoken out consistently ever since against all forms of coercive psychiatry, including ECT and forced drugging. Um, while serving as director of the Mental Patients Alliance of Central New York, he's also been active activists uh, for alternatives and network against coercive psychiatry. George spoke, I'll end with this, at the uh, National Council for Disabilities report, and he said, I would just like to offer a working platform. The first point is we speak for ourselves. Next, we seek, seek an end to forced treatment of any kind. We seek full access to community support, advocates and legal assistance and all involvement with the mental health system. We call for access to holistic alternatives to the medical model, monopoly of mental health services. We seek an end to destructive psychiatric labels and we demand accountability for the psyche from the psychiatric system. That is George Ebert. And so George, we wanna really honor you. You're way ahead of your time. Uh, really one of the, when you look back at the pictures of the early people of the movement, you are right in the middle of it. So we're so proud to be able to give you this award, proud to have known you, and proud that uh, you've done so much work here in New York State. So, George, if you could come on camera or however you want to respond. So this will be like the Oscars. I'll say Mr. Ebert is unavailable at this moment. Hopefully he'll come back on or we'll figure out the mechanics. But George, I hope you heard that. I know hundreds of people did and we'll hear more about it. The next award is the Brendan Nugent Award. Brendan Nugent, and you'll see, you know, later in the day, I think it's 2, 2.40, I mean, Len would know, we're gonna be having a memoriam, a 15 minute memoriam of photos of people who, have been leaders and in there will be Brenda Nugent and Francis Olivero, who many, you know the name, but you don't know the person. So you'll see that a bit later. But Brenda Nugent was a great hero. He's the first person, he's the person that to me organized the first peer, peer demonstration in the state, in this case in New York City. Um, 
So this is an award that will be given by one of our board members, Jeremy Ruling. Uh, thank you. So this is uh, the Brenda Nugent Award for uh, my friend and colleague, Amanda Sake. Um, I've known her since I think I, I went to a training she facilitated in 2013 and um, was so impressed like that she just was someone who really got uh, the recovery movement in a way that most trainers didn't it that I had uh, sat with and I wrote her an email and she wrote something nice back but when we really connected was through Niapris, um when we had both proposed workshop ideas and Harvey said, hey, uh, we have too many workshops. Can I put you guys together? And I think I might have been a little bit annoyed at the time, but it turned out to be a wonderful gift um, because I met someone who I've now had the honor of working and collaborating with for a bunch of years, and that's Amanda. Um, Amanda has recently, about a year ago, she took over at the Office of Consumer Affairs for New York State and has led by example doing all of the following. She treats everyone she interacts with dignity and respect, includes uh, including all individuals receiving services, peer specialists throughout the state, her own staff, and even the provider community. She advocates for recovery-based, trauma-informed, person-centered services, refuses to accept anything that does not meet those standards. She fearlessly shares her own unique story of resilience and proves that members of our community can make a difference at the highest level of our state's mental health system. She points out injustice where she sees it and works to elevate, elevate marginalized groups, including individuals who identify as BIPOC, LGBTQ+, trauma survivors, psychiatric survivors, immigrants, and more. Amanda walks the fine line as a member of both the peer and provider communities to bridge gaps between these two groups in service of transforming a system that remains broken in so many places. She works tirelessly because it's personal to her. It's not a job. It's worth noting that I've seen the Office of Consumer Affairs seems to have a renewed energy and sense of purpose lately. And I don't think this is an accident. I think leaders like Amanda inspire those who work with her to take initiative and find their own strength and sense of purpose in working towards mutual goals. They also inspire the communities they serve to speak out. So we need, we need more leaders like Amanda and she deserves this award so much and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present it to her. Amanda, feel the love here, feel the love. I know. Uh, Good morning. Um, thank you, Jeremy. I'm so honored to be receiving the Brendan Nugent Leadership Award. Uh, Brendan was a strong advocate and a pioneer in the peer movement. And I hope I can continue to carry the torch to honor his commitment to behavioral health parity, peer support, and a whole health approach to care. Thank you to Harvey and the whole Niagara's team. Thank you, Jeremy Rowling, who nominated me for this award. Jeremy, you are a cherished colleague. Uh, you ruined my eye makeup by crying um, and a friend. It is a true honor to be nominated by someone who's a champion in our field and you've helped me to grow over the past nine years. I'm also honored to be sharing the stage with Rita Cronice. Rita's contributions to the field are enormous. It's been a real pleasure getting to know Rita and I look forward to our continued work together. I haven't had the privilege of meeting everyone yet, so if you'll indulge me for a few extra minutes, I wanna share a little bit about my story and what fuels my leadership and advocacy. I always knew I wanted to help people. Uh, my father is a social worker and a special shout out to my parents who are watching this day and care would say, love you so much. Um, and I saw how good my dad did his work uh, as a social worker in his practice. And I want to continue that legacy. Um, when I was in high school, I started to experience a deep depression and an overwhelming level of anxiety um, that coupled with my misophonia led me to a very dark period in my life, a period I thought I would never recover from. I missed most of my junior year of high school. The psychiatrist that treated me was a nice guy. Many of you have heard me tell this story. Um, he had a surfboard in his office. We talked about music, particularly Bruce Springsteen, which is a staple of Jersey Shore small talk. And during one of our sessions, I shared I wanted to go back to school so I could go to college on time. He told me that I had a serious illness, an illness that I would have for the rest of my life, 
an illness that would likely interfere with my ability to go to school, ability to live on my own, and interfere with my aspirations of becoming a social worker. He said that my, his priority for me was to gain insight into my illness and accept the diagnosis I had been given. And I believed it. I had fellow friends who would come regularly to visit me when I was away from school. One of those friends told me that he was feeling like I was and was thinking about suicide. He told me that he felt like he could tell me because I was going through the same thing. Being able to support him with my own experience made me feel better and useful. I told him that in my personal experience, there were pros and cons for telling therapists about suicide and that I was very hesitant to share my own thoughts as I was afraid that it would trigger more intensive treatment and disrupt my life further. In hindsight, this is when I started to recognize that my relationship with mental health care was not grounded in healing and focused on my values and goals. It was about accepting a lifelong illness, developing insights and managing symptoms. Fast forward a bit, uh, halfway during my freshman year in college, that darkness returned and I ended up having to leave school. This was about a year and a half after the psychiatrist told me I had an illness that would interfere in my ability to function and go after my life goals. I thought to myself, maybe he was right, and I felt whatever hope I had left was gone, but my rebellious side wanted to prove him wrong. When I returned to school for the second semester, I met with my advisor in the social work program. I asked him what they told my fellow students and my teachers about my absence. He told me, we told him you had irritable bowel syndrome, which was technically right. As I had been given that diagnosis too, um, he then explained that they didn't want to tell the school about my depression and thoughts of suicide, as they didn't want the school to discriminate against me. He said, you're taking your medications, we're not worried about you, but it's best the school doesn't know. So in my formative years, I learned that mental health issues and stigma were tightly woven together. For the next eight years of my life, I kept my head down, took my meds, gritted my teeth during the dark times, kept my struggles to myself as best I could, and tried my best to function. I loved my career and my work. I didn't want things to get too bad with my mental health so I could continue to work and help people. During the first few years of my career, I noticed that people with mental health challenges were treated differently in the social service landscape. Programs didn't want to work with people with what they called serious mental illness or severe and persistent mental illness. Anytime anyone exhibited any symptoms, it meant that they were decompensated and needed the higher level of care I didn't like to see people being taken out of their lives um, and communities, and I felt it was an injustice. But all the while, in the back of my head, I still heard the words from my first psychiatrist and thought, well, maybe he was right after all about mental illness. But my severe and persistent determination to prove him wrong prevailed. Um, fast forward, when I was a, a pros director, I was sitting in on a group um, led by a nurse and a peer specialist. And at the beginning of the group, she shared uh, that she was an individual living with a mental illness and I was shocked and I asked my boss, can we share this? And she said, yes, there's training and support available for me if I wanted to incorporate my lived experience in my work. And while I didn't have time for the training right away, I started to tell the pros participants about my lived experience and the groups that I ran. And the support I received from them was amazing. I learned how to navigate my wellness in those groups and can't begin to express my gratitude for that experience. Uh, when I started the coalition, I used my lived experience in all my trainings. I went to intentional peer support training and pe met people like me, like Jeremy, practitioners with lived experience, um, Jeremy and Liz Breyer, and those relationships continue to transform my life and how I viewed mental health and wellness. My first presentation uh, before the one where Harvey uh, joined us together, joined Jeremy, was about being a practitioner with lived experience, and I met even more people with similar stories. The NIAPRS conference became my second family reunion. And I first heard that from Sarah Goodman, and it perfectly describes the NIAPR's annual conference experience. When I started in this new position at OMH, I was very nervous about how I would be received in the advocacy community as a hybrid social worker here. I had nothing to be nervous about. The community embraced me, and you all sustained me through the challenging times, more than you know. And I was also nervous about navigating the challenges of being the designated advocate at OMH. I'm glad those nerves were unfounded, too. I was welcomed with open arms by the folks at OMH and the advocacy efforts of myself and the Office of Consumer Affairs are encouraged and sought after. I want to express special thanks to Executive Deputy Commissioner Tavella and Commissioner Sullivan for your mentorship, encouragement, and the ability to freely represent the voices of the people we serve, including families. I also want to thank all my colleagues at OMH and at the Office of Consumer Affairs. Thank you for everything.
Now we'd be here for an extra hour if I mentioned all the people that have supported me along the way. So I hope my heartfelt thanks to you for everything you do and everything we will do together in the future. So in conclusion, the core goals that drive my leadership and advocacy are wanting to help others using my training and experience as a social worker, peer supporter, and advocate. Wanting to help inform a system where no one is told that a life worth living is unattainable for them. There are enough things in this world that contribute to a loss of hope and the behavioral health care system should not be amongst them. Wanting to end the stigma associated with mental health challenges that pervade our system and society. Wanting a system where Brendan Nugent's uh, vision for parity for behavioral health, inclusion of peer support, and a whole health approach to care is actualized. Wanting a system that recognizes the impact of trauma and works towards providing support and services that are trauma-informed and not trauma-inducing. And wanting a system that encourages healing, acknowledges resilience, celebrates the contributions of peer support and advocacy at all levels and in all aspects of the work. And I'm honored to receive this award and I really look forward uh, to working together with you all to make these goals a reality. Thank you. Amanda, thank you so much. And if you saw all the comments you were getting, it would really blow your mind. I want to thank OMH for hiring you. And, and I want to also, uh, it's kind of like a Supreme Court justice position. I hope you have it for the rest of your life. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk more. And thank you for all your work. I so appreciate it. All right, our next award, we got to run through these now, is Rita Cronice. This is, again, a heartfelt, this is the Nugent Award, which is around a particular sort of, um, of leadership. And in the case of um, Rita, it has to do with promoting peer services. Our board member, Matthew Petit, is going gonna, is gonna to give that award to Rita. And he's got two minutes, and Rita's got four. To the best of your ability. Thank, thank, thanks, Harvey. Uh, appreciate appreciate uh, this. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really happy, actually, to uh, nominate Rita for this award. Uh, before <clears throat> uh, before we saw such a boom in uh, peer services uh, with with the healthcare reform around five years ago um, and the need for for workforce development and integration, she was really integral in um, kind of heading up the Monroe County Association of Recovery Specialists. Um, and you know, now we're seeing these local peer uh, workforce communities of practice uh, becoming widely embraced uh, trends in our field. And she's, she's really kind of at the forefront, uh, really supporting these efforts. Uh, she's worked on a local level, a state level, national level, uh, in multiple settings, including academia, uh, to advance the values and practices of the peer movement. Uh, she's done this very consciously with a deep conviction, a strong spirit of collaboration, and incredible levels of technical skill. She approaches inclusion, equity, and empowerment intentionally uh, with a specific focus on those who may be more disadvantaged. Uh, these, to me, are exactly the critical ingredients we need Within, the very, within our various communities and the systems that serve them. Uh, she doesn't just believe in our principles or that uh, they should just be incorporated in services. She actualizes our principles even within system planning, education, and implementation efforts. I am uh, very proud to work with Rita and uh, to have the opportunity to acknowledge her for these efforts. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And I, I really <clears throat> am almost speechless, <laughs> almost speechless. But I just want to tell a little story. Um, it'll be a very short story. A little over two decades ago, Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood accepted an Emmy Award that made a real impression on me. And I'd like to invite all of you now, as he did then, to take 10 seconds along with me to think of all the people who loved you into being, the people who helped you to become who you are. And I'll time 10 seconds right now. So thank you. Just imagine how pleased they must be to have made a difference in your life, 
to know how important they are to you. And so many people have helped me to become who I am. Some are here today, some are far away, some have passed beyond this world. And I wish I had time to name each and every one of them, but I'll simply offer very special thanks to my family, my friends, my peers, my department chair and supervisor, my coworkers at the academy, and the students and graduates of the academy and all of you for being a part of my life. One person I will name, however, <clears throat> in the name of mutual support is Matthew. Matthew is a board member of NIAPERS and he nominated for me for this award. And for that, I feel extremely privileged, privileged to accept this award. At the same time, I feel very uncomfortable with this privilege. So let me explain. As you can see, Matthew is a dark skinned man. He lives in Rochester, New York. And Rochester's been in the news recently for the violent mental hygiene arrest and death of a black man named Daniel Prude. Not long ago, Matthew shared with us a story that he had an experience very similar during a very violent arrest. Fortunately, he survived or neither one of us would be here today. But that arrest and incident left in a deep emotional wounding and scarring. So Matthew and so many others like him who are using their experiences to fuel this movement for change are protesting, they're sharing their stories, they're bringing people together, they're forming coalitions, and Matthew is one of these tireless advocates. I hear this word tireless advocates all the time, except our advocates are not tireless. I think of George Ebert, and I will mention George by name. Our advocates are not tireless, they are exhausted. And so I just want to return to the privilege that I have in accepting this award and to use that privilege simply to ask each and every one of us to take 10 more seconds to reflect on how we can love each other into being. And I'll time it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for that wonderful award and uh, that spirit. And Rita, thank you for your service, your humility, all that you've done to bring peer support. I mean, you're really a key person who's really grown peer support throughout New York. And you have all these, I don't want to call them children, but you have all this generation of people that exist and are peer supporters and having careers in that way because of you. So thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna to go to the next um, ceremony here, and that is going to be Jennifer Parrish. There you are, JJ. I get to call Jennifer Parrish JJ, because I've known her a very long time. Um, and JJ is getting the um, Francis Oliveira Award. Francis, you know, this is for working on a particular issue. And Francis, as you'll see in the memoriam, was a key to the uh, writing an injustice by making sure people with psychiatric disabilities got the half fair benefit on the MTA downstate that, that heretofore had been denied. I met JJ, I've known you for quite a while, JJ, certainly going back to the Urban Justice Center, where I think you still are. Uh, you're a mainstay down there. And the issue that's become the most important to me and the most out, gives me the most outrage, as you know, is criminal justice incarceration, arrest, uh, solitary confinement above all, suicide. And throughout it all, you have such a, a, a good, devoted heart, but people don't realize you're a tough cookie. You have been on this issue a long time. You never quit. We have shared laughter together when we won the shoe, and we've cried together when we didn't get the halt bill, and we're not done with that yet. But you know, I just want to thank you for your. When Cliff talked about the, the group that came out to get the shoe bill, shoe is another name for solitary confinement, folks. JJ was a big part of that. So JJ, really on behalf of the board, I really want to honor and thank you for your work in this area. And I think we both hope that together we'll get 900 people right now with mental illness who are in solitary confinement in New York and all the others to come. So, in fact. Solitary for everyone, but go ahead. I'm interrupting you now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Harvey. I deeply appreciate Niapris recognizing my work in this way. 
but nothing I've done to advance changes to the criminal legal system for people with mental health concerns has been done alone. I've been blessed to work with so many amazing advocates, some of whom have lived through the horrors of our present system, others who have witnessed the pain that their loved ones were subjected to, and many others like me who could not stand by and watch what this unjust system does to black people and other people of color, people without resources, and of course, people with mental health concerns. The criminal legal system does not recognize the humanity of the people who are unfortunate enough to become ensnared in it. Jails and prisons are oppressive environments that re-traumatize the people who are held there. They are not a place for recovery. They're not a place for healing. Yet we subject thousands of people who have mental health concerns to this toxic environment without regard to the harm it causes their already fragile mental health. The most extreme form of this punishment is solitary confinement where people are held alone in a cell for as much as 23 to 24 hours a day. This practice has been recognized by the United Nations as torture. It damages people not only while they're in it, but also when they come home. Its effects are long lasting. It is incomprehensible to me that our political leaders allow this practice to continue when its harmful effects are widely recognized. I'm thankful to Niapris. I'm thankful that Niapris has supported the fight to halt solitary confinement and that we have had some victories in limiting the use of solitary over the years. I hope you will all continue to push for the state to enact the Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Solitary Confinement Act that will end the torture of solitary confinement in our state and also to fight for New York City to abolish the use of solitary confinement in city jails completely. Thank you again for this honor. Thank you also to my family, friends, and colleagues at the Urban Justice Center. Without all of them, I would not be able to do this work. Thank you so much. Gigi, thank you so much. Thanks for your dedication, and we are at your direction. Just tell us what we have to do next. We'll be there. Thank you so much. The next award is the Marty Smith Award. Marty Smith was... Um, an amazing person and provider. He and Jerry Smith, no relationship, really ran a clubhouse, a Fountain House model clubhouse in Watertown, New York. Uh, and very hard to do. And they were very devoted about it. And Marty was a very devoted individual and he's, he's passed away by now. But this Marty Smith Award is really given each year to essentially an agency that provides best practice, top shelf, uh, all hands on deck sort of care. And over the years, it's been given to people like groups like uh, Clubhouse of Suffolk, Baltic Street, so for Community Living, Rehabilitation Support Services, People USA, Services for the Underserved, Putnam Family and Community Services. So you're in no small sort of company when you win this award. And so I'm going to turn it over to, to Tiffany Monty to confer the award. Hi, my, I'm Tiffany Monty. I am um, the regional coordinator for Niapris, and it is my honor and privilege to um, give this award to Federation of Organizations. Um, I work for Federation of Organizations for about two, almost two and a half years at this point. Um, and um, as a peer specialist and as a peer who's active in the peer community, I hear about constantly peers having problems with supervisors who are non-peers. You know, they don't feel supported, the whole nine. This is not an issue for me at Federation. I am 100% supported by my supervisors, and I do truly feel Federation fosters that environment for peers to succeed, for the, their recipients to succeed. Everybody, they just foster success and they, uh, their core values of equality and respect for all really just starts from the top all the way down. And, if, and I don't like to say that, like, I don't mean that in like people are less than others, but I mean like supervisors, it just, the whole, in the business aspect of things. Um, so I, I'm honored to be able to have nominated Federation. I'm honored, I'm grateful to the board for them voting yes, and I'm honored to be able to give this award. So I want to say congratulations to Federation, 
and thank you for giving me such a pleasurable job. And we're looking for, for Philip Matkowski. Are you with us, Phil? I saw Barbara Ferrone on the phone. Okay. She's the CEO. Barbara but Farron. I don't know if she, if she, yeah, I don't know if I, I probably didn't say that right, but I don't know if she can get, get in. I don't know why she's, she's definitely yeah in the chat box, so she's definitely listening. Okay. So I don't know what the issue is. I'm not sure. Barbara, if you, uh, maybe the simplest thing is to call our office at 518 uh, 436 0008. We'll go to Eileen. 518 436 0008. Hopefully, you can do that soon because Tiffany's going to hang around and give the next award as well. So, we'll be here for you, Barbara, when you come on. The next award is the Jason Brody Award. Jason Brody, I think, was affiliated with Federation of Organizations back in the day. And he was a very kind and compassionate person, always a smile, always, you know, real love for people, really uh, a pr protector and promoter of people in the most humble of ways. And uh, I'm so glad that Tiffany and the board have approved Julie Erdman Burroughs for the award. And here's Tiffany to confer the award. So I consider Julie a best friend, a coworker, and at times, and in a lot of ways, she's even been my mentor. Um, I've known Julie uh, since she was pregnant with her youngest child, and her youngest child was 10. So almost 10, for about 10 years. Um, I've seen her, no matter what she's going through personally, whatever struggles is happening personally for her, she's always fostering in her job and in her career, with, and she's held many positions within the mental health field. Um, she's fostering recovery. She's always encouraging other people to speak to, you know, other people and encouraging other people. It doesn't matter how she feels. She always just fosters everybody else. And she has this very unique ability that I have never seen anybody else have um, where she she's able to see things in people and then force that person to be able to come out in the way she and I don't know how she does it but she always does it and I credit her to my recovery I she she if it wasn't for her I wouldn't have been introduced to Niapris if it wasn't for her I wouldn't be on the board of Niapris um, I don't think if, if it wasn't for her I may not even be working as a peer I may still be working with the animals um, and don't get me wrong, I still love animals, but <laughs> this has definitely been a lot more rewarding. Um, so I just want to, on a personal note, thank Julie for who she is. And it's my honor and privilege to give this award to you, just like it was my honor and privilege to give this award to Federation. I am so grateful for the to be able to be in this position to give an award some, to somebody who means so much to me yeah she's not she's not just my best friend she is my not my sister from another mother you know she is she's more than just she's family to me and it's great for me and it i like the fact that it's become to that point where we're family so congratulations julie thank you Thank you so much. That was such a big, warm, and loving introduction. I don't know what to say. I'm stupefied. I do see that, that Barbara Ferrone, the CEO for Federation, is on, too. Um, and should I get, feel like should have had the crack at the bat sooner. I'm sorry it didn't work out that way. But I just want a quick plug to the organization I work for. I'm also a New York State Certified Peer Specialist working in HCBS. Um, I, I was a child in the 70s and a teen in the 80s to give you some sort of uh, context. And I did not decide to go back to graduate school until after I started working at Federation of Organizations. So um, that has a lot to do with the people that were around me. And as Tiffany mentioned, the warm sort of environment. So I'll say that, thank you. Um, is anybody else hearing an echo? Yeah. Yeah, I'm hearing an echo. Is maybe somebody off mute? I'll put myself back on mute. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. 
So, um, as I said, at the time that I grew up, um, there was not, there was an issue going on for me. Um, I was very bright, but at the same time too, I wasn't doing well in school. And it was thought that I was lazy because when I could perform, I did it so well. And, but I couldn't keep it up. I wasn't consistent. I stared out the window and kind of the nature versus nurture sort of debate. It, it's no longer a debate anymore, thankfully, you know, and I did have um, some trauma early on too. So a combination of that and probably now I'm seeing with my kids now, but uh, ADHD without the hyperactivity, the inattentive type, I kind of, by the time I was a teenager, I had become adversarial. The system did not help me, the educational system. They, um, they blamed me. I began to blame myself. I didn't trust anyone around me. So uh, I ended up becoming a chronic truant and then getting sent away to an out-of-state terrible school at the time in the 80s. And, uh, and then I went to college and things got better. I found theater. I love the arts. And um, then again, I had another period in my senior year where things sort of fell apart, which again was prompted by a situation that wasn't great. And, and at that point though, at the, in that time of falling apart, I became close to a lot of people. This sort of, this thing where I had to perform and you know, now being, and literally perform, but I felt like I had been doing that for so long. Um, having those experiences and those friendships and um, being part of a cast or being part of, you know, the back part of production or writing a play or things like that became such an avenue of expression, but also a vehicle for connection. It was really powerful for me. Um, but then I, again, I, I couldn't pick myself back up throughout. And again, here's, here's something. When I came into this field, it was after I worked as a waitress in the Hamptons. I had three hospitalizations in my 20s. And I showed up to this interview because for a while I had worked with people with developmental disabilities and really liked it. So I applied for this position that was at one of these agencies. And I found out that they also had a mental health program and what they wanted me for was to be the assistant manager of a community residence. And I thought, well, that's strange and ironic. I had a dent in the back of my head from at the someone actually pounding my head into something. So it was really, um, it, it, there, there was an irony to it and something that, it, again, two worlds that were kind of not together on some level. So I started working there and that's when I, I um, found through Niapras, Harvey, um, and some people who came, it was Chaku, came to my organization and they spoke and they shared their stories. And at that point I was in the closet as far as not disclosing my, um, my lived experience. And it wasn't until something that was very non-mental health related actually put me there. And, and it was in 2005 I had a baby that was born early and died in the neonatal intensive care unit. And for me, that was, um, that was of course a traumatic experience, but at the same time too, I feel like it deepened my, um, I don't know, my heart, my ability to feel compassion and make connections with people. And also my world got bigger. There were people that I wanted to be there for um, that maybe weren't even in the system and, and connections that I made then that were apart from being in a system. And there were some wonderful people that I knew at that time and I decided to, um, to leave my job for a while and write. So I did, I wrote, I had more children, I have three. And, um, and then I met some people when I got back into the field that were writers, were poets, 
were um, performers, musicians. And then we all got together and started meeting in living room. And, um, and then from there, we went on to go find stakeholder support and then do some anti-stigma events. And uh, from that, I made these lifelong connections with Tiffany being one of those connections. And, uh, and my world has changed so much. And I decided to go back to school uh, to practice social work because I really want to push that forward and being able to reach more people. And the world right now is, is full, filled with so much tumult. Um, I think the plans that we got to, to going to uh, Washington, D.C., that Harvey had set up for us and being able to go do that and round up the community to do that has been a real honor and privilege. And it's all work that comes from the heart. And I'm overwhelmed by this. I can hardly speak. I'm usually a lot more eloquent. I can, I can barely speak right now. I'm so overwhelmed. But I just want to give my heartfelt thanks for this beautiful award. And um, namaste. Everybody have a thank great you. day. Julie, thank you for your courage. We wouldn't have gone to Washington had you not been part of that. There's so many things that wouldn't have happened on our board had you not been so sort of courageous and spoken. And you've, I've always admired who you are and how you do it. And so glad you've been part of our family. So Couldn't do it without all of you. Thank you. Barbara Farron, thank you for hanging on there. We were just giving props to your agency. Maybe you heard it in the background, but you know, this, this award, the Marty Smith Award is something that we, we dole out very carefully and we just dole it out to the best agencies in New York that we can find. And so we've given them to a lot of the agencies uh, that have met our criteria and have been looking forward to when we could give it to you, which we're doing right now. Uh, the Federation, I've admired the work you've done for so long, whether it's, you know, in your pros programs on adult homes and the, 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 the state hospitals uh, and throughout, and you've always been a real supporter of recovery and of NIAFRS. You've always sent people to the lobby day and to the, uh, the conference. And so, you know, you, you really are a real believer with us, a real partner with us, and we wanna thank you for your excellent work and that of all your staff and your agency. You just want to take it off um, mute. There you go. Oh, oh, you had it. You had it for a second there. There you go. I have to learn to be in show business. What can I tell you? First of all, I want to tell you, this is on the default mode. It should have been uh, Phil McCoskey, our uh, chief operating officer who was on, but he somehow the picture didn't work. Uh, and of course it's, I just want to thank Tiffany and Julie because, for nominating us and for being, you know, for being exemplary in terms of all that we're trying to do and be, and luckily be part of our team. So I think that at Federation, we've always had that approach. I, I mean, uh, it really comes out of the recovery movement. Actually, when we started, the idea was that people who were in recovery from mental illness back then in 1981, when the dinosaurs roamed Long Island, the idea that people who had spent years in the psychiatric hospital could do anything sensible uh, was quite unusual but i i saw that that was the truth because i saw the recovery of aa al anon and the other kinds of recovery groups with that were going on where people were helping one another to uh, move forward and I, what i really just i don't want to go on and on but we always had thought about working working together as a team to have everyone who listen my motto is i need all the help i can get and the people who have the experience of living with mental illness certainly have a, a very important part to play in showing the importance of re the possibility of recovery. And then, and recovery is not the most important thing, and then I'll shut up. The most important thing is recovery is not one thing. It's like there's all these different people with different levels of resources and abilities, but each person can find the most 
satisfying life. And luckily for us, we do, we can work together to support one another in that effort. And that's what Niagara's has been about. And of course that is what Federation has been about. And for me, what's most satisfying is seeing, you know, I tend to be less involved in day to day in a certain sense. So to see that actually it's working with people who are entering our system and becoming part, productive part of our team. And that is, you know, I don't need, I can't even tell you how rewarding that is. So thanks so much. And thank you for everything. It's a tribute to your leadership, clearly, that your agency is in the position it's in to give such excellent help and have staff that are, are so grateful to work there. Barbara. Well, as I said, I need and all We're glad you're a member of Niapers and <laughs> may you always be. Well, thank you, folks. Let's go to uh, our next award. We were talking earlier about, about, about criminal justice. And it's, as you know, it's become a big theme for Niapers. And, uh, and JJ and a number of us working on this HALT bill were sort of, you know, unto ourselves. The issue wasn't well understood. We were sort of being outgunned by the unions and other groups. Our message wasn't getting across. Uh, to enough audiences at the, in the right way at the right time. And um, I would, there's a news area there they, they, where the reporters are in the Capitol. And I would go by and Dan is very flashy, you know, a very energetic sort of person. And uh, he just had, he, he grabbed the issue. He helped us. He covered it and he covered it consistently and uh, was on it like on a regular basis and wouldn't let go of it. And you, we can't thank you enough for that, Dan. That was just so important. And even mo more recently, you know, we're the, for the providers here that are on the uh, call or with the NIAPRs, we're up against it. The worst financial sort of threats we've really had in all the years I've worked in this area. And I know you did a fabulous story with Glenn and Andrea and other people for a whole half hour that you created. So I just want to thank you for your interest and your skill. This is an award we've given to people like like Michael Weinrip and Cliff Levy of the Times, or famous investigative reporters, to your friends. I know Susan Arbetter and Liz Benjamin and Karen DeWitt. So we're so happy to uh, give you this award and to thank you for your fabulous work. And we look forward to a lot more uh, with you. Yeah, of course, I'll be really brief. Uh, it's been wonderful hearing from everybody uh, during the ceremony so far and all the great work that you've been doing. Um, Thank you so much, Harvey. On the issue of solitary confinement, when I started, now I work for PBS, obviously doing a statewide show, but when I started covering the issue, I was working for the New York Law Journal. And when the HALT bill, when the organizers came to the Capitol, I found it surprising every time that uh, the other reporters in the LCA, the group of reporters in the Capitol, would brush them aside and say, that's an issue that isn't important, it doesn't need to be covered, I'm not gonna pay attention to that today. And I just found it to be such an important issue for people both in terms of criminal justice, but in terms of mental health as well. Um, and I tried to look at it from all sides and cover every development as it went across. And we all know what happened last year with the HALT bill. And uh, after the HALT bill failed to pass last year, and I'm talking about last year as in 2019, not this past session, um, the governor, uh, as we all know, put forth these regulations. And to this day, those regulations still aren't in effect. And I think that's such an important part of journalism is making sure that when we have these things happen in place of things that we keep on them and that we make sure that we're asking the right questions and asking people, why haven't these gone into effect? Um, so look forward to my continued reporting on solitary confinement because uh, the regulations are in effect. The HALT bill is gaining more traction than ever, and I think it's going to be a really interesting issue, especially as we face the state's financial crisis. And in terms of mental health, that's another issue that unfortunately a lot of journalists in New York State don't pay a focus to. And just personally speaking, I think it's because a lot of them may not have dealt with their own mental health issues or they're not comfortable talking about it. And I've been a reporter who's been very comfortable talking about how I've struggled m with my own mental health in the past, both with anxiety and depression. And I think that fuels a lot of my coverage around the issue because if we're not paying attention to this as journalists and we're not the ones that are asking the questions of what is a 20% cut to providers like all of you going to mean, then who's looking out for the people that are struggling with their own mental health? So 
um, just thank you so much for this award. And, um, you know, I hate to be the guy who says it, but I'm just doing my job because th these are the kind of issues that I care about and these are the people that I care about. So thank you so much. Thank you for your disclosure. There's nothing more powerful than disclosure to fight stigma, Dan, and for your interest and your passion about it. And we're all available for interviews after this uh, award show, if you'd like. <laughs> if any of you have any story ideas ever, please let me know. Okay, you bet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next award is the Quincy Boykin Award, and that's in heartfelt recognition of inspiring contributions to the recovery, empowerment, integration of the full diversity of all people with mental health and related challenges. This award has been given to Marguerite Gale, Celia Brown, Chaco Mathai, Lenora Reed Rose, Bert Kaufman, and today it's being given to Dr. Deborah Wilcox by Marguerite Gale, our, our new incoming president. Hello everyone. On behalf of the Niapris board and community, I'm pleased to present the Quincy Boykin Memorial Award to Dr. Deborah Wilcox. Dr. Wilcox has been an active member of the Niapris Cultural Competence Committee for close to three years. Um, our choice of Dr. Wilcox for this award is in recognition of the many qualities she has demonstrated that reflect the powerful work Quincy did on behalf of mental health and communities of color. We are recognizing her leadership, which includes the, uh, her recent development of a COVID support group, What the People Say, which is an interstate network of community members sharing information and support related to surviving COVID. We're also recognizing her commitment to peers and peer support including using her consultancy to help a group of peers from her area in Denver to uh, develop a, a, SAMHSA, a SAMHSA grant to be able to share the resilient story circles um, nationally if they get, uh, if they're ch chosen to be funded. Um, we want to recognize her commitment to peers and peer support, her um, pioneering work in the use of the resilient story circles as a vehicle which strategically uses peer support to, to create healing. Uh, we acknowledge that Dr. Wilcox is an outstanding and outspoken advocate, showing courage in exposing racism as it evidences in policy and practice and is active in building the peer provider community. We love that she believes in building bridges of inclusion. She has been selfless in her caring for the New York mental health community as demonstrated by her traveling across the country to participate in our conference over the last two years, except this year with uh, COVID, we're not doing it, but she was able to sponsor the group um, P to P, she may be able to explain that group, um, that when they did this workshop this past Tuesday. So she's uh, actively reaching out and supporting peers in growing their contribution to the work of recovery. And, and that's what she does. She's a teacher and she's an inspiration. We are grateful for her presence in our community, and we are honored to present her with this award today. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Marguerite. You know, as you were speaking, and thank you for all those um, compliments. Um, I was just thinking about when I first met you. Uh, I, I kind of, I was at the conference, and I browsed in the, um, in the cultural competency room, the culture room, and you were there working, and we start to chat. And I just remember that we had long conversations after that. I think after midnight one night, just talking about uh, mental health and recovery and social justice and the African-American community. It was mm -hmm. so rich to get to know you as a person. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. And then of course, getting to know you here recently a lot, a lot more. Um, I just wanna say I'm, I'm totally humbled to accept this award and uh, in the honor of Brother Quincy Boykin. I didn't know him, but I am honored in his spirit 
of service and justice and peer support uh, initiatives in the, in the New York community. And Marguerite has informed me about his work uh, during the 9-11 and how special that was in terms of providing you know, unrelenting support to peers during that challenging time. I'm also humbled to be able to receive this award from Niasporus as an organization and get to know Harvey and also to be very active in the Cultural Competency Committee. And uh, Marguerite, I have been active since 2000 and um, let's see, it's been about five years now. Uh -huh. just, okay, and I've, I've presented at the conference uh, about uh, four times uh, okay. with Teresa Hall, who, Yes. you know, who's totally awesome, and Jeff Gwynn, and uh, David Newton. I've gotten to know lots of folks, <clears throat> and I really miss being in Upper State New York, and one of my favorite times is, like, being able to dance. <laughs> I just love being in the tent and dancing. Uh, but I want to say I got into this work. I'm a counselor educator. I have a clinical master's in uh, community clinical counseling, but my social justice passion comes from my family who's always been involved in social justice from in my small hometown of Ohio, uh, Mansfield and NAACP and all kinds of other initiatives of bringing uh, Black Women United, bringing the community together across differences. That's my passion. Um, that's what I learned about how to have a good life is to be about helping justice. But I came into the wellness work around mental health and recovery. And I too have had some audiences with Dr. Anthony, uh, Bill Anthony. I've had some, some extensive professional development with him because he worked with our project in Ohio mm -hmm. that uh, we had a special grant from the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services from 2006 to 2013. We had a blank slate because agencies around the state of Ohio were asking, how do we become recovery focused organizations? How do we shift ourselves out of the medical model and embrace the principles of recovery and, and, and peer support? So I was active in PRA, the Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association, uh, got involved in some conferences there and meeting some people. So I was hiding my, heightening my consciousness and education about what it really means to work in community uh, uh, with individuals who suffer with severe and persistent mental illness and addiction. And, I've, and learning about recovery aligned with my highest value, two highest values, my value of community and my, my value to, uh, around the fact that all people are equal as human beings. And one of the things that I've learned from Niasporus when I got involved with Niasporus that really hit my heart is that Niasporus really cares about people from a core, from a humane perspective. And that's what really, I said, wow, I belong to a number of professional organizations. But when I, got, when I came to the Niasporus conference, I said, these folks is where I need to be. You know, so I've learned so much and it's also helped me with my own recovery and it keeps me well to be involved in this work. So I do not have a hierarchy status in this work. I'm in community. And um, so I want to say that our challenges in this work and mental health, wellness, and recovery, we have the sauce to make it happen, and we're making it happen. However, we got some challenges as we look at cultural competency and we start to continue to explore the role that culture plays in sustained health and well being. And that's for all people. Every individual has ethnicity. One of the things that I learned in practice, which is something that I value that you don't, knowledge is generative, knowledge is not static. We learn as we practice, is that when I worked in Ohio and we aligned the um, a distress of, of, of stigma, which is quite often, you know, it's pervasive in mental health conversations and our recovery work. But when I, we as a team aligned stigma with racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, and other kinds of prejudice plus power oppressive constructs that exist in our system and exist in our society. When we align stigma with those other elements, 
peers begin to build authentic relationships across cultural differences. We saw the shift happening in various agencies across the state of Ohio. We, we saw the building of peer communities so there wasn't a we they around black and white. There wasn't a we they around provider um, recipient of services. It became a community of wellness and recovery. And I saw that shift occur. So I know we can do this work, but we have to begin to embrace culture across our cultural differences because that's where the dignity and respect gets demonstrated. So I, I, I wanna, as I conclude my remarks, I wanna say that our challenges ahead is to make sure that we support shared power in care, that we understand that we share power, each one teach one, and take the hierarchy out of the system of mental health recovery. And I know that that's the work of Niasperus, and I wanna to continue to be involved with the Cultural Competency Committee and working with Marie, Ma, Marguerite and Teresa and all the committee to try to move forward the initiatives that we have laid out as a committee. So I just wanna say that building the peer community we have to embrace culture. We have to embrace the principles of, of, of recovery in the peer community. And we have to embrace holistic person care. So without, um, that's my concluding remark. And what I wanna also end with is the fact that we have lost two giants in social justice in the United States. And that's the Honorable John Lewis. And I want us all to keep getting in good trouble around changing the mental health system and also Ruth Boehner Ginsburg being able to say, I dissent and not be afraid to uh, dissent. So I want to, uh, like for all of us, as I lim uh, uh, conclude my remarks, is to say this, that we are one in humanity. I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am, I say, I say, that's an African pro proverb that says we're one in humanity and we can do this work. Thank you so much. I am humble and honored. Thank you, Marguerite. Much You're appreciation. Thank you, Harvey. Well, there's one thing that's very clear about this. I've always been impressed that we have a member on the committee from Ohio. That's very unusual. Mm -hmm. But you need to change that. You need to come to New York because we need that guy uh, here in New York. Well, that's a conversation that we can definitely have. Let's have it. I'm, <laughs> I'm an Ohioan it. and I've learned so much out here at Denver. Uh, the Denver community and the Marguerite, the, in, the organization right. that we were uh, speaking about, we did the uh, Wellness and Resilient Story Circles uh, yes. on Tuesday, and that's mm -hmm. the Poetry for Personal Power out of Kansas City. They rock. There are young adults who are involved in the arts, and they are moving forward like freight train in wellness and recovery through the arts. We should look them up. I know we were talking with them. Yes. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Wilcox. Congratulations yeah. again. Thank you, Marguerite. Thank you, Marguerite. We're to our final award. And, you know, hang on a little bit. This is going to be a short film from Congressman Paul Tonko, uh, Congressman from New York State, and particularly in the, uh, from Amsterdam over to Albany and such. Uh, Paul has been a great champion for us for quite some time. I'll be brief. Uh, he's both been in New York, the leader, and the reason we have a parity law that requires mental health services to be offered on a par with, with uh, medical or physical care. In Washington, he uh, was really a fighter against what's called the Murphy Bill. They had me come and testify. He was very supportive of that. Um, that's a bill that would have brought a lot of coercion and a step backwards uh, from the recovery and community-based approach. Um, he's been very active in something called the Medicaid reentry bill. He's got a bill in front of uh, Congress that would restart Medicaid before people leave jail and prison. Uh, that's critical. So people don't fall through the cracks, get out and have no health care and no worker to work with. That would change if this was done. And finally, he's been very supportive and, uh, and Dan will know this too. He's very supportive with us on the uh, budget issue. It's a real crisis. Um, so anyway, uh, Lena and Eileen, I believe we have a video from uh, Paul. Good morning to all in attendance at the NIAPRS annual conference. It indeed is a pleasure to be with you virtually today. Let me offer my heartfelt thanks for this award. It has been one of the honors of my life to work side by side with NIAPRS and the entire mental health community to advance policies that meaningfully improve the lives of those struggling with mental health or substance use challenges. In particular, 
I'd like to thank your CEO, Harvey Rosenthal, for the partnership and friendship over the years and for lighting the path of recovery for so many in need. As many of you know, my transformation into a mental health advocate began when I served in the New York State Assembly, having the honor to meet a young little leaguer named Timothy Eau Claire. Timothy easily lit up a room with his smile, but underneath he was struggling with multiple mental health challenges. Timothy's insurance company put him through a roller coaster ride, and when there were benefits available, Timothy was <coughs> able to thrive. When those benefits ran out, Timothy suffered. After a long and brave struggle with mental illness, Timothy completed suicide at the age of 12. In Timothy's honor, I fought alongside the Eau Claire family to pass Timothy's law in the state of New York, which required insurance companies to offer mental health benefits on par to physical health benefits. Our fight in New York helped pave the way for the Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, landmark legislation which continues to improve the lives of countless individuals today. Timothy's memory continues to inspire my activism and interest in mental health to this day. There is so much work that needs to be done to ensure that preventable tragedies like Timothy's don't keep happening. Today, our nation faces grave mental health challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Anxiety and depression are on the rise. Substance use and overdose deaths are at record levels. In these troubling times, we must rededicate ourselves to the mission of fostering more resilient individuals, families, and communities. I commit to being your ally in this fight for our frontline medical workers and all who have been dealing with the magnified stress brought on by this pandemic. I will fight for research on the long-term mental health impacts of this pandemic and strategies to help increase mental resilience. For those incarcerated individuals who are disproportionately impacted by mental illness and substance use, I will keep fighting to improve access to treatment and care coordination for a smoother transition back into the community. For those ravaged by the disease of addiction, I fight to ensure that when you are ready to seek treatment, there will be a system ready to welcome you with open arms rather than a closed door. And for all those quietly struggling with their mental health, I'll keep fighting for a better tomorrow, a brighter tomorrow. Thank you again for this award, and I look forward to keeping up the fight together. You know, Paul is so genuine and passionate, and that is just so strong. I'm, I'm actually talking, answering him back as if he was live. But he is very live, he's a very sincere. What you're seeing there is Paul Tonko very sincere, very passionate, very committed. He's the real deal, and I hope we get to see him rise up in Congress. Well, it's been quite a ride. We've honored a lot of really tremendous people, heroes, pioneers, exemplars, partners, inspirations. Uh, always makes me feel good, and I'm sure you, I can read the chat box, that you're feeling it too. But you know what? I just wanna look in the camera and say, they are heroes. You are heroes, each of you carrying that, that uh, flag of recovery and rehabilitation and rights all these years and now when it's needed most. Rights are under attack, you know, funding for services, uh, dignity, all of these uh, challenges. And we're, we've never been needed more. And as you can tell here, we have the strength, we have the people, we have the energy, the conviction, the outrage. We have to just stay within this this big tent that we've created and help each other through. Um, and I'll just end by saying, everybody vote, please. Everybody get to the polls. We need every vote. So thanks again. Len, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Just want to remind people to stay tuned for some great workshops this afternoon and um, following us and this uh, award ceremony. We have the interlude for the duration of lunch. So. Grab your lunch, come back to the computer, enjoy some great music and great videos. And at 2.30, we're gonna have the, mo it doesn't show it that way, there'll be a memoriam sort of uh, video right. that I think you really, it would be inspiring. We'll see you then.